بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم آئی ایم فخر لودی اینڈ دس از آور فورٹی سیکنڈ لیکچر آف فارمل میتھڈس فار سافٹ ویئر انجینئرنگ سو فار وی ہیو بین ڈسکسنگ فارمل اسپیسیفکیشنس فار کمپلیکس سسٹمس اینڈ ڈفرینٹ ٹیکنیک میتھڈولوجیز فار اسپیسیفائنگ دی بیہیویئر آف دوز سسٹمس یوزنگ فارمل ٹیکنیکس ان دیٹ وی اسٹڈیڈ horse logic we started with horse logic and then we looked at algebraic specifications and then we looked at model based specifications and specifically z specification note one thing that uh, a program itself is kind of a specification because it has precise meanings anyway those specifications although in some cases they are useful for specifying the behavior of uh, distributed and concurrent and real time systems also but these specifications they do not explicitly talk about some of the issues that we have to deal with when we specify distributed concurrent systems or real time systems today we shall start a new specification technique basically a new method for modeling our systems and this is very useful for modeling distributed and concurrent systems and real time systems there are many different uh, techniques uh, for these kind of systems also but the one that we are going to discuss and uh, Uh, uh present in the class is a graphical technique so it is mostly a graphical notation so we specify the behavior of concurrent distributed systems or real time systems using this graphical notation it is as i said since it is a graphical notation actually it is a graph but this graph is very special kind of graph usually when you have a graph the graph does not have any information about the dynamics of the system and as we all know that distributed and concurrent system the most important aspect that we have to deal with is the aspect of dynamic behavior of those systems and making sure that we do not have the problems such as deadlocks such as starvation and so and so forth in those systems so this graphic technique that we are going to discuss today and in the next couple of lectures it is useful to present uh, the dynamic behavior and argue about the dynamic behavior of the system so we can model the dynamic behavior of a concurrent or a distributed system or a real time system using this graphic notation and we will then use it uh, to not just represent the dynamic behavior but also argue about things like deadlock starvation and so and so forth so this is a very useful notation from that point of view this special type of graph or graphical notation is called petri nets after the person who invented it karl petri is a german scientist he invented this notation in early 60s as part of his phd doctoral thesis and it becomes uh, so uh, popular and useful that the entire thing is now known as petri nets and there is a group uh, which does a research on petri nets petri nets as i mentioned is a graphical notation it is actually a, a directed weighted bipartite graph in which we have uh, nodes and we have links there are two types of nodes in our system 
these two nodes are called places and transitions. And then we have links directed edges which are called arcs. And we shall be using this, we shall look at many different examples, including some of the classic examples uh, like uh, dining philosophers and producer consumer and bounded buffer and reader writer problems. And we shall see how easily can we specify the behavior of those kind of systems using this notation that is petty nets and how can we easily argue about it. So hence it is a very powerful thing. So let me show you the basic structure of a petri net and then we will talk about certain properties of a petri net. So let me show you that petri net. So here is a basic structure of a petri net. The circles and the bars, these are our nodes in the graph. So the nodes are these circles and these bars. And the links or the edges are the directed edges. The circles are called places. The bars are called transitions. These are called arcs. And this is a bipartite graph. We have edges from a circle to a bar and a bar to a circle and so on and so forth. So we have edges from bars to circles and circles to bars, but we do not have edges between two bars or two circles directly. So two circles or two bars, they are not directly connected through an edge, they would be connected through some intermediate circle or a bar as the case may be. The edges can be weighted, but uh, initially, you know, we are not working with weighted edges. So if there is nothing written on the edge, that means the weight of that edge is one. So we can have multiple edges going from a circle to a place to a transition and from a transition to a place and so on and so forth. The same thing could be represented by weights on the edges here. So a basic Petri net, as I have shown you here, has three basic components. The three basic components are the places, the transitions and the arcs. Just like any other directed graph, but you know we have two special types of nodes here, two different types of nodes and these two types of nodes are uh, represented by circles and bars. One is called a place, the other one is called a transition. Otherwise we have edges and another restriction that I have just mentioned earlier was that we are not going to have links between two places. So we will not have an edge going from one place to another. It must go through a transition. And similarly, we cannot have an edge going from one transition to the other without passing through a place. So this is the only restriction that we have. Otherwise, it is just like any other directed graph. Now, if you look at this directed graph, it is an ordinary graph. There is no dynamic behavior present in this graph. You cannot say that you know what is going to happen. Where is the dynamism? Where is the dynamics that we promised that we need to uh, do in order to talk about things like deadlocks and starvations and so on and so forth? The dynamic behavior 
is given by something, another component in this graph, a fourth component, and that is called a token. We have tokens in this particular case, both of these places, they have one token each. So this black dot here or black circle represents a token. These tokens, they give, they specify the dynamic behavior of the system. So when we look at all these different places, some of the places they have tokens in them and some of the places they do not have a token. So when we have tokens in a graph, these tokens they are called the marking. So we have the initial marking and initially we have one to token each into these two places. What is the purpose of these tokens? The purpose of these tokens is to enable the transitions that we have. Each transition, for example, this transition has one incoming edge. These two transitions, they have two incoming edges and one outgoing edge. This transition in this particular case has two outgoing edges and this one also has two outgoing edges. These incoming edges, the places and the tokens, they are the ones that specify the behavior of this system. We say a transition is enabled if it has the number of tokens present in its source places. So for this transition, for example, we have two sources and there are two edges. So both of these edges have weight one each. So that means that this transition requires one token from this place and one token from this place. And if the place that uh, feeds this transaction this transition has the required number of tokens, then this transition is enabled. So since this transition has tokens in both of uh, the places that feed this transition, hence this transition is enabled. On the other hand, let us look at this transition. In this particular case, we have a token in one of the places that is an input to this transition, but the other place does not have a token, hence this transition is not enabled. It needs to have the required number of tokens in it. So here what we are saying is that we have marking and this marking is uh, the tokens and these tokens, they provide the dynamic behavior in a Petri net. The first thing that we need to understand uh, in order to understand the overall dynamics of the system is that a transition is enabled only when it uh, places the input to the uh, transition have the required number of tokens in it. So for example, if a transition has only one place as input and it requires one token, the edge from the place to transition has weight one, that means it will require only one token. And if the place has five tokens, fine, the transition is enabled. It needs one, it has more than one, so it is okay. But if it has zero, then in that particular case, the transition will not be enabled. So we look at all the places for that transition, the, uh, for which we have 
the edge from the place to the transition and we say the transition is enabled if it has the required number of tokens in all the places that are feeding this transaction this transition so some of the transitions in a system will be enabled and some of the transitions will may not be enabled it is possible in a system that more than one transitions are enabled in the example that we are looking at there is only one transition that is enabled but it is quite possible and we shall see several examples of such cases where we will have uh, a number of transitions enabled simultaneously and then you know we will talk about the concurrency and so on and so forth but that will come a little later but let us look at when a transition is enabled what does that mean now this transition is enabled if we go back now if we look at this transition go back and you know we have uh, the tokens in the enabling places that means this transition is enabled when the transition is enabled it can be executed so this may uh, sort of uh, represent a process or an event or whatever an action so this process uh, takes action so we say okay enabled transition is fired so what happens when you fire the tokens that are present in the uh, these places they are taken from here and they are deposited in the uh, destination place from the transition so let us look at this so both these tokens that were present here they were taken and one token since the edge had only weight one this uh, one token is deposited in this place now when that happens that means this transition is no longer enabled because both its uh, enabling places they have no tokens in it so it requires one token in this and one here and since none of these has any this transition is no longer enabled but now we have another transition which is enabled and in this particular case the uh, it requires one token in this place and the token is present so this transition will be now uh, is enabled and can be fired when this transition is fired it has one edge going from here to this place and another edge going from here to this place so it will have these two places as outputs so when this fire so it will deposit a token in both these places so let's do that so when it fires this token was taken from here and since it had two edges so one token was deposited here and the other token was deposited in this place and now with the result what we have is we have this transition which is now enabled because now both its places they have required number of tokens and hence this transition is enabled and next this transition will be fired and we will continue this process so this is the dynamic behavior that is we in this uh, model you know uh, there was no specific uh, kind of system that we were trying to model here but you know in this model what was happening was initially we had tokens here so this transition was fired then this transition was fired then this transition will be fired then this transition will be fired and then this transition will be fired and this transition will be fired so it is kind of uh, an alternative set of transitions that are that we are going to fire uh, which has been modeled by this uh, petri net by this very simple system so here we saw a very simple example of a petri net in which you know there was a certain sequence of transitions 
that you know we will fire first transition, then second, then third, and then fourth, and then first, and so on and so forth. It could have been very easily modeled using a state machine. In a state machine, you know, you have something very, very similar. But what gives it power is that, you know, we can have the specification of concurrent systems. And so this specification was a very simple specification. So it did not uh, uh, show you real power of petri nets. But the idea here was to just uh, show you the basic concepts of the petri nets. So there are four, five things that you need to remember and understand. One, we have places, transitions, and arcs. So these basically form the basic petri net, a graph. We can have directed edges from a place to a transition and from a transition to a place. So that is what the system is all about. The dynamic behavior of the system is specified with the help of what we call tokens. These tokens, they are, we have some initial uh, set of tokens present in some places. So this is called marking. So we have some marking. With the help of this marking, we specify the dynamic behavior of the system. We say a transition is enabled when we have uh, tokens present in all its enabling places in the required number. So if, for example, we have an edge from place one to transition one, and this edge has weight two, that means we would need two tokens in uh, this place before this transition can be enabled. So a transition needs tokens in the required number in all its enabling places. And if even one of the places does not have the required number of uh, tokens, then the transition is not enabled. When the transition is enabled, it can be fired. So that means that action is performed. When a transition is fired, it takes uh, the tokens from the enabling places, sources. So for example, a transition needs two tokens from place one and one token from place two. So it will remove, when it is fired, it will remove two tokens from place one and it will remove one token from place two. And it deposits the number of tokens specified by, once again, the weight of the outgoing edge from transition to the place into the target place. So if the uh, outgoing uh, uh, edge had weight one, so it will take three from here, two from here, and deposit one token to the output place, depending upon you know, what are the different weights in the inputs and the output. And it may deposit uh, to a number of places. So in, in one example, we saw that you know, it was depositing to only one place, the first transition. The second transition was depositing to two different places. So when the tokens are you know, taken from places and then deposited into the subsequent places, they disable some transitions which were previously enabled and they may enable some transitions which uh, were not previously enabled. And hence, we know what next is going to happen or what can happen next. There may be a number of transitions enabled at any given time. And when that happens, then we take an arbitrary decision and we say, okay, we will fire any one of these at random taken taking an arbitrary decision on that. And hence, that kind of thing gives us concurrency and the dynamic behavior of the system. So this was the basic uh, information about 
a petri net. Let us look at some of the interesting uh, models of petri nets, some basic models, and then we shall use these models to specify some interesting complex systems. So let me show you a slide for basic models for uh, petri nets. Our first model is model for a concurrent system in petri nets. So here we have uh, a set of six places and two transitions. In the first case, we have uh, a transition uh, which uh, takes input from two places and it uh, produces an output which goes into a third place. We have a similar kind of uh, system in the second case. So this whole set of six places and two transitions is our petri net. Since in both these cases, for both the transitions, we have the required number of tokens available in our places. Hence, both these transitions are enabled simultaneously and can be fired. So this is they are totally independent and they kind of can be executed in parallel or in sequence, whatever. So we are not putting any constraint in which order these two transitions will be fired and hence we have a model for concurrency. So in this very simple specification that we uh, saw here, we saw how can we model concurrency. So when we have in our Petri net, we have a disjoint set of uh, uh, our places and tokens and transitions. We can use that, you know, when disjoint set of transitions are enabled through independent places, that means it's a totally concurrent system. They can be executed in parallel or in sequence, whatever they have no bearing on each other. And this is a very useful kind of thing whenever we want to specify such a system where we don't want any restriction on the order in which certain things need to be executed, we model it using this kind of uh, a set of places and transitions. In many cases, uh, what happens is that, you know, we have the notion of this parallelism, but in parallel system, we say if we execute A, then we will not execute B. If we execute B, then we will not execute A. This is kind of, this is the mutual exclusion kind of thing. We either do this or do this. Both of these, they are enabled simultaneously, but only one of these should be executed at a time. So we have a problem of psi, psi, uh, kind of a critical system. So in a critical section, what happens is that, you know, we do not, cannot let any other process enter its critical section if some process is already in its critical section. So that is where uh, we need this kind of mutual exclusion. And how can we model this mutual exclusion? Let us go back onto the slide and see once again. Now we have a set of places and transitions and arcs. We have two transitions and these two transitions, they have two input places each. But the interesting thing here is to note that one of the places is common to both these transitions. So we have these transitions A and B. The central place has an edge going from this place to both these transitions. So it will enable whenever there is a token present here and the token present in the other places, both these transitions will be enabled. But this is a situation which is called a conflicting situation because the central place has only one token and if a transition is fired, either A or B, that token will be taken and it will be deposited into the output uh, place, but that will make the other transition, that will disable the other transition. 
So we take a token from this. So we can either fire A or B. We cannot fire both of them. So when we fire A, B will be disabled because then the central place does not have a token. And you know, by the way, A will also be disabled because one of the tokens that has been taken from the central is no longer there. So the central place does not have any token. So it cannot enable any of the transitions. Although the enabling places, the other enabling places, they do have tokens present in them. So what happens in that particular case, if we execute A, B will be disabled, and A will obviously be disabled, and if we execute B, then we cannot have A as well as subsequently B. So both of this, these will be present, but you know, at a time, important thing is, at a time, only one of these is enabled, and only one may fire. So here, what we saw was mutual exclusion. We create a conflicting situation by sharing a token in more than one transition. So what happens in this particular case, when we have a place which is shared by more than one transition, and it has only one token present in it, that means that this token can either go to first transition or to the second transition. It cannot be used in both. Only one transition will be fired, and the other one will have to wait till the time the place gets another token, somehow, maybe through recycling or whatever. And then at that time, it will be enabled, and then we once again take an arbitrary decision if more than one transitions are enabled simultaneously, which one of uh, it will be used, it is an arbitrary random decision. So this is a very useful formulation. So we have seen two formulations. One is parallel uh, concurrent uh, execution, where both of these, they were independent, and the second one, when both of these, there were conflicts, so only one could be executed, although both of these were enabled simultaneously. As I mentioned earlier, and in the example, starting example that I showed, we said that we could model a state transition uh, machine using Petri nets. And in that particular case, you know, we will talk about the dynamic behavior, what is where we are and what is going to be uh, next. In the state uh, machine, we specify the behavior and we know from where we can go where, but we do not know where we are currently in the system. But when we model our state machines using Petri nets, we know exactly where we are and we know exactly what is going to happen next. And here is one example of a state machine. Uh, it is a vending machine where you can deposit money to get different uh, kinds of things uh, from the uh, machine, depending on how much money do you deposit. So this is kind of a very simple state machine. It does not have uh, too many complications and complexities that you would otherwise find in a vending machine. We have only two uh, types of uh, things that you can buy from this uh, machine. So in one case, you have to deposit uh, 15 units of money. In the other case, you have to deposit 20 units of money, and then you will get your desired uh, thing from the vending machine. So how can we model this thing? We have two types of uh, uh, units of money, 5 units and 10 units. So you can deposit either 5 or 10 at one uh, time, we don't have any other units. And then using those five and 10, we will make uh, 15 and 20, and then we will get our output. So let us look at this finite state machine for this vending machine. In this vending machine, we have the five states, uh, 0, 5, 10, 15, and 20. 15 and 20, these are the states from where you can buy your desired product for 15 units or 20 units. And in order to reach that state, that is state of 15 or 20, 
there are some intermediate states. So we start with zero. If we deposit uh, a coin with five units, we go to state five. From five, we can deposit 10 to get to state 15. Or we can deposit uh, another uh, five units to get to state 10. From 10, we deposit another five units, we get to state 15. When we are at 10, we can come to 10 from zero directly by depositing a coin of uh, 10 units. From there, we can go to 20 by depositing another coin of 10 units. We can go to 20 from 15 by depositing a coin of five units. And when we utilize that money, that is 15 units or 20 units, and get our product, we are back to state zero. That is, we have the case where there is no money in the system deposited. We can model this state machine using petri nets. So we have a number of transitions. These transitions, we start with the initial place and we put a token there. So we have the first transition which requires five, the other transition coming out of this, uh, the first place which has the token, we have, this is transition 10. So when we deposit uh, a coin with five units, that takes us to the place for five units. And when we deposit 10 units, so we go to the place which has 10 units. So we have a conflict decision or choice in the starting phase. And at each place, we have a number of choices present. Either go to 10 or to 5, depending upon what do we deposit from there. And hence, we go to the final state uh, where we can buy our thing. So we can have, uh, we have the state for 15, we have the state or place for 20, and we can buy those things using those, firing those transitions. And when we fire that transition, after buying the product, we will get back to our initial state where we can again start the process. So here we saw the modeling of a state machine, finite state automata using petri nets. So petri nets can be used to model simple things like finite state machines or and we shall see soon that they can be used to model very complex systems where we need to specify the concurrent behavior or distributed systems or the real time systems. One thing that uh, once again you need to note uh, that I mentioned uh, earlier also, that is the difference between a finite state machine and a model of a finite state machine using a petri net is that after a transition has been fired, we know exactly where we are. In a finite state machine, the dynamic behavior is not specified. We really don't know what is going to happen next. This is just a static model. It gives you the picture, it knows, it tells you, you know, what are the possibilities if you're here, where can you go? But where you are, that place is not known. Whereas in the case of a petri net, you know exactly where you are and you know exactly what next can happen. So this is a big difference and it helps us in visualizing systems dynamically. Now let us start discussing the models for concurrency. And there are several different models, several different uh, uh, models that people have created starting from simple uh, producer-consumer problem to bounded buffer to reader-writer to dining philosophers and so on and so forth. So we shall start our discussion with a very simple producer-consumer problem. So let us look at the model for producer-consumer. In this particular case, we have a producer and we have a consumer. The initial marking is that you know we have a mark present in a place in the producer and we have a token present in a place for the consumer. The transitions we have, there is one transition which is enabled in the producer process. However, 
in the case of a consumer, no transition has been enabled. It's a very simple kind of thing that you know you consume, you cannot consume unless something has been produced. So you first need to produce something, only then consumer can consume it. So what happens is that this transition has been enabled in the producer. So once that transition fires, token will be deposited uh, in the enabling place for the consumer. And once that place has a token there, then the transition in the case of consumer is also enabled. So we have both these transitions enabled, that is in the producer as well as in the consumer. Now producer can produce another item and it can keep on producing and it doesn't need the consumer to consume any and the consumer can keep on consuming as long as there are available items that have been produced and they yet need to be consumed. So this was a very simple formulation of the producer-consumer problem. In this formulation, we needed the first uh, transition to be fired on the producer side because producer has to produce first before it can be consumed. And on the consumer side, you know, once we have an item that can be consumed, now we have enabled transitions on both sides, on the producer as well as on the consumer, and both of these, they can uh, work on the items and producer can keep on producing and consumer can keep on consuming as long as there is something present that can be consumed. But there is no restriction on the producer. Producer can keep on producing and the items that are produced, they will be deposited in that central place that enables the consumer to consume. There is no upper limit on how many items producer can produce. There is no upper limit on how many items can be stored in the central place. But in practice, we usually have a space restriction. When we have a space restriction, the problem that we have is known as the bounded buffer problem. The buffer in which we can keep our items has an upper bound. So you cannot have more than those many items in the uh, storage and the producer then cannot produce anything until you know we have the empty space available. So what can we do? We convert this producer-consumer problem into the bounded buffer problem by putting certain restriction. And how can we introduce that restriction? Let me show you. Very simply, what we are going to do is we are going to have the, the number of tokens and that will indicate how many items can be produced. And once that is exhausted, that means a new token, new item cannot be produced. So the producer will have to wait until a consumer consumes something and space is created. So let us look at that model for bounded buffer. So in the bounded buffer, what we have done is we have the same producer and consumer. The only difference is that now we have two places. We had only one place previously, but we have now two places and it is free slots and as well as the occupied slots. Initially, we will have a number of tokens available in the free slot. So what will happen is, let's say our buffer size was four. So we will have four tokens in the free slot. 
there will be nothing in the occupied slot and we have the initializing place in both the producer and consumer it is marked with a token so there is only one transition that is enabled here in the beginning and that is the transition for the producer so producer can produce an item so it goes into the temporary place from there it can be sent to the buffer which is a shared which now consumer can use so what happens is that we have a token in that place and we have a token present in the free slot since we have tokens present there we have this second transition in the producer that transition is enabled a token is now taken from both these and now we put that into the occupied slots so what will happen is that you know when we uh, keep on doing this thing let us assume that uh, the consumer has not consumed any of the tokens produced then after four items produced by the producer it cannot produce any more items it cannot store any of the items in the buffer it will only be able to store those items in the buffer once something has been consumed that means if an item is consumed from the buffer then we will have a token present in the free slot and that will enable the transition in the uh, producer that can uh, that will put the item in the bounded buffer so this cycle will continue so what we have done here is in the case of this bounded buffer what we wanted was we wanted to put a restriction on how many times producer can produce before the consumer has to consume and then only then producer can continue producing more items so this model that we have uh, shown that was the model for the bounded buffer once again is a very interesting model and shows how can we actually impose restrictions on the number of transactions on the number of transitions that can take place so in that particular case what we did was we put everything in the free slot so we said you know all the items uh, or the slots or the buffer was initially empty so there was nothing in the occupied slot everything was on the free slot so whenever we uh, produce one token from the free slot is taken and now we have one token added to the occupied slot and whenever anything is consumed the token from the consumed occupied slot is taken and it is put in the uh, free slot so the number of free slots and the number of occupied slots the total number remains constant a token is taken from here and put there and from there it is put back into the free slot so the tokens this cycle in these two areas that tell us how many slots are open and how many slots are closed how many slots are free and how many slots have been occupied so this is a very useful model that can be used in many different scenarios and then otherwise when there are there is this partial uh, full uh, partial uh, occupation of the slots in the buffer and partially it is full and partially it is empty then we have the scenario where both producer and consumer they can work simultaneously and concurrently you need to note one thing here and that is very important that you know although there may be many transitions that are enabled simultaneously in the case of producer and consumer we said that when it is partially empty and partially full then both producer and consumer can produce but only one transition will fire at a time 
there has to be an order. We are not saying which one. The decision is arbitrary, but only one at a time. This will ensure mutual exclusion. This will ensure critical section. So when we have this kind of a system, you see if we can implement, we can model a very useful kind of thing. Uh, we can have restrictions, we can have mutual exclusion, and we can have other constraints modeled using petri nets. The discussion on petri nets uh, continues. We shall, inshallah, continue this discussion in the next lecture, and I'll show you more formulations. Till that time, Khuda Hafiz or Aslam Alaikum.